The Lord expects more out of us than out of anybody else. Why? Because we are the people he has entrusted his very words to. We know his mind. We know what he's thinking. We know his grace and mercy. We know his wisdom and truth. It's all right there. If we would but say, speak, O Lord, your servant is listening. After all, Jesus said, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Now, I know when we talk this way, we can feel a lot of pressure. God expects a lot out of me, but I'm not perfect. But by the end of this sermon, I want to show you that we really wouldn't want it any other way. We have everything we need from God to carry out what he's given us to be and to do. You know, Amos may have thought this way. He was only a farmer. I snip the fig trees so they produce figs. I harvest figs. That's passed down from one generation to the next. It's not that difficult. You just got to show up and work. I tend the sheep. I breed the sheep. I'm a farmer. I have leather skin, tan skin. I'm calloused. I'm a country boy. What do you want with me, Lord? You got other educated people to go to the north part of Israel and warn them about what's going to happen 40 years from now. But God expected great things from Amos. He expects great things from very normal, down-to-earth people like us because he's with us. And then there were the people of Amos' time, booming economic times. They had never seen such wealth in the north part of Israel. Assyria was staying put. They weren't bugging the northern tribes. Their borders were safe. In fact, they had military conquests that were extending their borders beyond what they had ever been before. Um, they were raking the dough in, at least some of the population, getting uber wealthy, spending lavishly on their homes and even on places of worship. And uh, they were even starting to be proud of their nation once again, like they were in the days of old, those ancient kings, David and Solomon. And what did they do with all this wealth and prosperity? We might think if America could return to its greatness, we'd all be fine again. Well, what do people do with wealth and prosperity if they're following their own wills and desires and not the Lord's? Well, they took their gold and wealth and they constructed places of worship. Godless places of worship. They not only brought their grain and their oil and their animals to be sacrificed at these high places, but even their children. They did what the nations around them did. And... They went there to meet with temple prostitutes. They would pay them so that the Lord may continue to to send rain on their land and bless the fertility of their land. That's how the minds of ancient peoples outside of God's chosen people thought. And there they were doing all that with their wealth and prosperity. The Lord expected more of them because they had been entrusted with his very words. Prophet after prophet Abraham to Isaac to Jacob and Joseph and all their descendants after that was passed on from father to son, from grandparents to grandchildren. There had not been a break in passing on that baton of God's word, and yet what were they doing with it? Throwing it all away, turning away from it. Shameful, horrendous. And so God came after them like a mother might do when her child is lost in the grocery store. Not going to let it happen under his watch. He's going to give them every chance to repent, to turn from their evil ways. He comes to them through the unlikely farmer Amos, which he usually does. That unlearned country boy. These are God's special people. He's going to take extreme ownership of them. He will not sit back and watch them self destruct. He's going to send a messenger from the south. Amos is from the southern kingdom. Sometimes God has to send us people from the outside, right? Right? And they come into our lands, and at first we're suspicious. They're different from us. 
They're not speaking like us. But Amos travels to the north, and they know. If they knew one thing, they knew he was a prophet. The way he talked, the message he brought, he was not bringing a a message that would give him popularity in the polls. He was saying what they didn't like. It was abrasive to them. And, but if they would have turned, Assyria from no, the north would not have come 40 years later. But they hardened their hearts against Amos and more against the Lord. Here's what was going on. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, all right, this is a phony priest. This is a fake priest who's using his position for wealth and comfort and a power trip, an ego trip. That's what he did with the Lord's word. He, he sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. All right, the priests and the kings work together a lot of times. And depending on what was counseling them, God's word or the thoughts of, of men, that's how they would run the kingdom together. So he sends a message to the king. Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to endure all his words. This is what Amos says. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will certainly go into exile away from its own soil. Then Amaziah said to Amos, You seer, get out of here. Flee to the land of Judah. Go back to the south. Go back where you come from. Preach to them. You may eat food and prophesy there, but you must never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the sanctuary of the kind of the king and the national temple. Notice they've made that place of worship into a human-centered place. It's all about the king and the nation and not about the Lord of nations. You see what we, how we do this? Then Amos responded to Amaziah. I was not a prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. Rather, I was a sheep breeder and I took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending flocks. I'd rather be there, right? The Lord took me and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Wow. I added a few more verses because we have to hear what Amos is going to tell them. But now, hear the word of the Lord, you who are saying, Do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. This is what the Lord says. Your wife will be like a prostitute in the city. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled out with a measuring line. And as for you, you will die upon unclean soil. In other words, in a foreign, godless land. And Israel will certainly go into exile far away from its own soil. In one of the surveys you filled out when I had the call to Tampa Bay, I asked you for some feedback on our ministry here together. And some of, you, some of you said you would like to hear more about apologetics in sermons. Apologetics is when we defend the faith with historical evidence, archaeological evidence. Um, we say this, this, this is really uh, not just made up stories. This is real history, real stuff. And it's, it's helped people throughout the ages in all sorts of cultures. And we actually have evidence here um, that Amos was a real guy and that the stuff he said actually happened at the time um, the Bible says it happened, okay? I was inspired recently to uh, bring this up in sermons occasionally when appropriate. I was talking to a couple who traveled to Israel and just how real the events of Jesus' life and ministry became to them when they went to the places, And so I just want to bring out a little point here that Amos says in the beginning of his book that uh, this all happened two years before the great earthquake in that part of the world. And archaeologists have actually found that in the year 760, okay, with their dating and everything, 760 BC, so 760 years before Christ, there was a great earthquake in this part of the world. They found evidence of that, digging down, and uh, later on, Zechariah, centuries later, he also talks about the same event. Okay, why am I sharing that with you? Not only to show you that Amos was a real guy and he spoke and prophesied in this time, but even more importantly, let's take it to the next step. Amos prophesies 40 years before 
the Assyrians come and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel and then take people into exile. So this means that his prophecies, his predictions actually happened before the conquest happened that, that he predicted would happen. We need to know that stuff because that right there shows that prophecy is real. God keeps his word and he does what he says he's going to do. All right. But even taking this beyond history, practically this means that God expects more out of his people than out of anybody else. He showed it right here. He has entrusted his, his word to his people. And when they behave like buffoons and yahoos and unbelievers, he's going to be gruff with them. Even if it takes using a farmer. So what does this mean for us? Do you and I perhaps settle in life and think, God can't speak through me. Why would he work through me? I'm only a guy who runs cables or who runs numbers for a living. I'm only from such and such a little town or a no-name family. Why me, Lord? We would still be hiding in mediocrity if the Lord had not called us by name like he did for Amos. After all, we are, we are his chosen people, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Our purpose is to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. He has a high and holy purpose for us. He chooses to speak through normal people like us. He chooses to minister to others through us. He chooses to hear our prayers. And he even says our measly little prayers where we stumble and fumble and even lose track and get distracted and fall asleep. He hears them and they are powerful and effective because we are his people. A holy nation that goes beyond national borders. A people belonging to God. So what do we sacrifice ourselves to? What do we sacrifice our children to? There was human sacrifice going on at this time in their history. And we might think, well, that is barbaric. Though we would never do that. But what do we give all our time and energy and treasures to, our whole selves to? What are we hoping to gain from all that sacrifice? What are we hoping to prove how long will, will what we gain in this world last? What we build for ourselves, how long will it last? And that approval and admiration we're, we may be trying to get by our hard work, will anybody really notice? Does anybody really care? How long will, will that approval last until somebody is, is upset with us and not happy with us anymore and we got to work for them all over again? Is that what life's all about? We would still be trying to keep up with the Joneses. I mean, is it, that's what this is. Keeping up with the Joneses. Comparing ourselves to others. Trying to outdo the next person. Trying to have more than the next person. And we're, it's always like we're chasing something and we're not content with it. It's not enough. We would still be trying to do that if, G, if our Lord had not sacrificed his child for us. As if we were worth more than gold and silver and Bitcoin and a Michael Jordan rookie card. That's what God said by giving his own child for us. By putting him on a cross. That child he loved. He took the most valuable player. And he traded him for bench warmers. Washed up bench warmers like us. That's what the cross is all about. He spared no expense. No energy in gain, gaining us back. And he didn't only do this to get us back when we die. All right? It's not only about getting us back when we die, but about getting us back right now. Our, our entire being, our time, energy, our strength, our, our minds, and all our abilities so that he can employ them in his work and his purposes. All the work we do in his name puts investments in other people that outlast this world. Think of that. When we speak in his name and we minister in his name, we are putting investments in other people, a deposit in other people that will outlast their bodies 
and the places and times in which they play and work. It could be the difference for them between living without purpose and living a meaningful life following the Lord's purposes. It could be the difference for them between dying without hope And you and I have seen people die without hope and their relatives just look at the grave. What's next? This is all there is? This is as good as it gets? It could mean the difference between dying without hope and dying with peace and confidence that they are the Lord's. It could mean the difference for them between dying under God's judgment, not being quite sure if God is going to be happy with them and what's next, and dying under the Lord's smile. That one more has been found and will never be lost. That's what our work means in this world. It's how significant it is. That's why God expects more out of us than anybody else. Because so much is at stake. So much is at stake. And he trusts the Amoses like you and me to speak and do his work. So what do we do with our prosperity and with our blessings? Where are we investing it? Where are we spending it? Do we build a name for ourselves? Do we build comfort for ourselves? Do we surround ourselves with excessive entertainment and and excessive work and excessive stuff because we're trying to distract ourselves from the feelings of inadequacy within and the troubles without? Well, why? Why would we do this to ourselves? What more of a name do we need than the name God has given us? Forgiven, redeemed, rescued, holy, you are mine. We are in his favorites, in his contact list, in his phone. And he sends a message to us of reassurance, rescue, and resurrection. What more comfort do we need in this world than the fact that we are immortal, that his resurrection is our resurrection. What more entertainment do we need than wholesome and healthy relationships with the body of Christ, where we can be known, we can belong, and we can know where they are weak, we are strong, where we are weak, they are strong. What more do we need than to walk with God and turn from evil and repent of our evil ways along with our fellow believers? What more work do we need than than the work of him who kept God's beautiful commands for us? Why do we feel so inadequate? Why do we feel like such failures, so unimportant? That's not how God feels about you. You're looking within too much. You're looking within too much. Instead of looking to the God who came roaring and thundering out of heaven to make you his own. You're focusing too much on your feelings of self-condemnation. Instead of on the God who has no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, And why so discouraged by all the troubles around? Did not God promise that those who do his work will be persecuted? Will have trouble? Did not God promise that by enduring all of that with him, you're proving to the world that God is still alive? Did not God promise to speak to his servants who are hard-pressed on every side and to keep them afloat? God expects that his people will listen to him. And that they will do life differently than the world. He does have high standards for us. He didn't just forgive us. We can fall right back into sin and foolishness like the northern tribes did. He forgave us so we could be a new people. Do life differently. So we could continue to repent and turn from evil ways towards the Lord's ways. The northern tribes didn't want to hear this. Don't say it. Don't say it. Go back to the south. Let us be. They knew Amos was a prophet, but they wanted to continue on in their foolishness. They wanted to live for this life, which you know is so short. So short. My life is almost halfway over, unless God has other plans. 
That's all there is? No, God has so much more for us. But the northern tribes placed themselves back under God's judgment that he wanted to save them from. Assyria came. All they had built up was crushed. It all went up in smoke. All their prosperity and wealth, like a $100 bill that you take a match to. Poof. This is a lesson for us. There's some people, people here who have been going through our historical archives. And it's a wonderful project, saving the history of our church, the history of God's people, so that uh, future generations can access it. So we know where we've come from as we plan where, where God's taking us. And I was paging through recently with, with one of the people preserving these things, and I, f- I found this, this message in there. When we did the remodeling project that you're currently enjoying here, um, we made sure to put this at the top of the page as the first thing. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. The building we do with the Lord will last. The building we do in hearts and minds and lives will last. And buildings only serve that purpose. They only provide a space to do it. Right? Take the warnings of the later prophets who said, These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Amos wrote all this down and preserved it. It's been preserved through the ages, handled with care, copied carefully so you could read it as well as a cautionary tale. What an honor that God expects more out of his people. Would we want it any other way? No. We're his people. We're his kids. We're the objects of his love. He's given us so much, no less than his very words and his own son, the word made flesh. Amen.